be our first introduction to hypothesis tests. Hypothesis tests are a little, let's just be honest, they're a little crazy the first time you see them. I think we can get through this with a solid motivating example and the incredibly helpful words of our textbook Modern Dive in section 9.3. But we will eventually work towards, uh, in fact, starting in this video, the treatment of hypothesis tests that you can find in our other textbook, Biostat. Uh, 4.3 has like a short introduction to it just before you get to subsections 4.3.1 and 4.3.2. I'd like you to read that short introduction in uh, 4.3 that leads off section 4.3. So, um, this video and then Modern Dive section 9.3, I think are going to be the simplest introduction for you to this topic. Uh, it'll kind of provide the most concise and conceptual understanding of these ideas, so long as you have gotten the idea of sampling distribution down. And then, uh, and starting in this video, we're going to work towards the more mathematical treatment in our textbook Biostat. So certainly after you watch this video and then read section 9.3 of Modern Dive, and then maybe watch this video again, then you should turn to our textbook Biostat and read the intro to um, section 4.3 and then the subsections 4.3.1 and 4.3.2. The way I like to introduce hypothesis tests is with a motivating example that generally has nothing to do with any of your majors. And the reason behind that is this topic is so kind of wonky that I think if we can use a more tangible example just about you and a, an imaginary friend um, playing basketball, shooting free throws, I think that's going to make this idea more conceptually understandable. So I'm going to go through the motivating example, and then I'm going to put new words to the motivating example. Like I'm literally just going to go back to the motivating example, and I'm going to slap new words on different sections of the example. So we will eventually give these new words strict definitions. And here are the six new, okay, most of them are phrases, but whatever. We will eventually give these words strict definitions, but I want you to see them in particular examples before you get the strict definitions of these words. Um, and then, in fact, what we're going to do is repeat example in R. Um, yeah, okay. That's how we'll end the videos, by repeating the example in R. So let's dive into an example. Suppose your close friend claims that she makes 90% of the free throws she shoots. And so if you're anything like me, you have to stop and go look up a free throw online, maybe watch a YouTube video, maybe check Wikipedia for a quick definition, whatever you need to do to understand free throws if you don't already stand the bas basketball idea of a free throw. It's just standing a fixed distance away from the hoop and shooting behind some line, the free throw line. So your friend claims she can make 90% of the free throws she shoots. That, in fact, is an impressive claim. It is a claim many professional basketball players would like to have true for them. So if, in the world of statistics, we're going to try to analyze this claim, she is essentially claiming that the true population proportion of shots she makes is equal to 0 0.9. Her claim is about a population parameter, and we often call the population parameter for a proportion p. So what she's claiming is her population proportion, p, 
of the free throws she shoots is equal to 0 0.9. And now in this world of hypothesis testing, either her claim p equal to 0 0.9 is true, or an alternative claim that her true population proportion is something less than 0.9. We will not specify the other value her true population proportion p might take on. We're just going to state that either her claim is true or her claim is somehow not true by the true population parameter p being less than 0.9. So in the world of statistics, we want to analyze this claim. We want to imagine that if she were to go out there and shoot some number of times, we could estimate her true population proportion. So if she shoots n equals 50 times, that is, you say to her, your claim seems ridiculous. I want empirical evidence. You go stand behind that free throw line and shoot 50 times. Then we can calculate p hat. That is, from her 50 shots, we will mark a 1 if she makes a free throw and a 0 if she does not. And when we have 50 observed values of her successes or lack thereof, we can calcula calculate the mean of the ones and zeros to get her estimate p hat. Now let's think of it like this. If p hat is equal to 0 0.2, then the claim p equals 0 0.9 seems incredibly unlikely so unlikely that we should probably cross it out and instead decide p is less than 0.9. If you put her to the test and she gets up there and shoots 50 shots and she only makes 20% of those 50 shots, I think you're going to look at your friend and say, I don't believe that your true population proportion is equal to 0.9. If she only made 20% of the 50 shots, you'd be like, no way, your claim is bogus. I don't believe that you make 90% of your free throws. You probably make something less. Okay, let's consider another scenario. If, on the other hand, p hat is equal to, like, look, let's be honest. If your friend shoots 88% of shots out of, like, 55, you're going to sit there and be absolutely floored. If she can make 44 out of 50 shots, that's going to be amazing. If she could make 92 out of 92% of the 50 shots or 96% of the 50 shots, any of these that she might make would lead you to believe that p is equal to 0 0.9. And that seems the better choice between these two. So I'm going to leave this blank here, or let's not leave it blank. Let's say if she made 0 0.88, uh, 0 0.86, 0 0.92, 0 0.94, if she made any of these shots, really, if her estimated population proportion was any of these values, you'd probably suggest that 0.9 seems like the better choice between the two claims. It doesn't matter which of those values really she chooses. I bet you'd believe that her population proportion is closer to 0.9 than it is less than 0.9 based on any of those numbers. Okay, here comes the tricky part. In the world of statistics, what we actually want to do is establish a probability based on her estimate p hat. So what we really want to do is calculate a probability 
of observing p hat for whatever value of p hat she might get or something more extreme that is if she shot 0.96 you're probably likely to believe that 0.9 is her true population proportion of made free throw shots more than you are likely to believe her true population proportion of free throw shots is less than 0.9. So, or something more extreme, giving your friend the benefit of the doubt and assuming She's telling the truth. That P is equal to 0 0.9. This is a probability we formally want to calculate. We want to calculate what's the probability of observing P hat if her claim is actually true. 0 0.9 is her true population proportion. The way we do this comes all the way back to the discussions we just had in this class. p hat is really a mean. It is a sample mean of observed values, ones and zeros. We know that the sampling distribution of sample means has a specified shape by some grand theorem we have in this class. This grand theorem, the central limit theorem, tells us that if we take p hat and we subtract off some value, I'm just going to call it the true population proportion, p, but we know, according to our friend's claim, that's equal to 0.9, and we divide by the standard error, then this thing is approximately distributed, normal, centered at 0, and a standard deviation equal to 1. It's from this that we can calculate these probabilities because of the central limit theorems uh, telling us how the sampling distribution of p hat is we can calculate the probability i have listed on this page so let's just dive one more layer deep into this by the central limit theorem p hat minus this true population proportion, which according to our friend is 0 0.9, divided by the standard error is approximately normal, centered at 0, scaled to 1. And for now, let's just call this statistic z, because we'll need to refer to it here in a little bit. So we know that z, under repeated sampling, even though we're not actually going to do that, we theoretically could, z takes on this shape, centered at 0, with a standard deviation of 1. Now, if p hat is greater than p, that is, in the numerator of this statistic, p hat is bigger than 0.9, then please take the time to ensure that you understand that z is greater than 0. In this case, z is somewhere over here. And in this world, we can calculate this probability I refer to on the previous slide as this area under the curve. In this case, this probability, and let's just indicate that I refer to the shaded area under that curve, is relatively large, like close to 1. And if this probability is relatively large, due to the fact that p hat is greater than p, that is, our friend shot something like 0.96, which is greater than her claimed probability p, then p equals 0 0.9 seems the better claim 
or at least, and this is a little weird coming up this phrasing, but this is the more technical way to phrase it, at least there is little evidence against P equals 0 0.9. So it seems like the more likely claim. Okay, that is one scenario of these two scenarios. So that's like this one down here. We just checked that one off. If p hat is relatively large, then we're going to be able to calculate this probability. And if this probability is relatively large, p equal to 0 0.9 seems the more likely scenario. Next, let's do this one. So we're going to start the same way. By the central limit theorem, p hat minus p, which we know will be equal to our friend's claim, divided by the standard error is going to give us a statistic z, which is approximately normal centered at zero scaled to one. That means z is a random variable that has this shape where it is centered at zero and scaled to one. If p hat is less than p, then z is less than zero. And I ask you to really think about that fraction. If you get p hat equal to, say, 0.2, and 0.2 is significantly less than 0.9, then you're going to get a statistic down here. z is less than 0, and we can calculate this probability in the left tail. Then this random probability that the world of statistics wants us to calculate is relatively small. And if, well, let's not say if, let's say, since this probability is relatively small, then p equals 0 0.9 seems unlikely. Or there is, whoops, strong evidence against p equals 0 0.9 and p less than 0 0.9 seems the better choice. That is, if your friend shot 20% of her 50 uh, free throws, then 0.2 is significantly less than 0.9. So you're going to get this negative statistic z. z is going to show up less than 0. And we're going to calculate this probability in area under the curve to the left of z. Now, this probability that we're calculating under the curve is relatively small, in which case we have evidence that her claim, p equals 0 0.9, seems unlikely. That is, there is strong evidence against her claim because she only shot 20% of, of the free throws. And in fact, there's such strong evidence against her claim that we're going to decide the other claim that her true population proportion of made free throws is less than 0.9. This is the process of a hypothesis test. Now, this is my best attempt to show to you this process in a relatively straightforward way. I know it seems crazy, 
But in fact, what we've done is avoided all of these words because these words outside of this particular example are difficult to understand. So what I'm gonna do next is put these new words to the example. And we're just gonna go in order. Null, hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, test statistic, null distribution, p-value, and significance level. So let's just move to each new page, one at a time, working our way forward. So our first word is null hypothesis. The null hypothesis corresponds to your friend's claim. So this is our null hypothesis because our friend made the claim that her true population proportion of free throw shots is equal to 0.9. So let's see if I can be quick about highlighting this. Here is our first phrase, null hypothesis, corresponding to the particular example we used before. Now, the other claim is what we call the alternative hypothesis. So really, our goal in the world of statistics is to decide, or not the goal in the world of statistics, the goal in the world of hypothesis testing is to decide between the null and the alternative hypothesis. We want to evaluate claims made by, well, it could be your friend, it could be some company, it could be some politician. We want to evaluate claims made by somebody. And we want to understand, is the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis the more likely statement based on the evidence we have? Now, the evidence we have shows up not in p hat itself, but in fact, in terms of this value, z. Oh, sorry. This value here is what we call the test statistic. And the test statistic is the value we use to evaluate which hypothesis, the null or the alternative, seems more likely. The way we evaluate which hypothesis seems more likely is by calculating this test statistic and then using it to obtain Let's see, what do I have here? The area in the curve. So the area underneath this curve, established by the sampling distribution and the central limit theorem, is actually named the area under the curve obtained from the test statistic, which came all the way from our evidence, our data in p hat, is a named quantity. The name of this probability obtained from the test statistic, which came from our uh, data, is a p-value. So we use the p-value. You guys just have to watch me switch back and forth between colors. Maybe in this new whiteboard scenario, there's a way to switch between colors more easily, but I don't know it yet. So once I figure it out, it'll be a little cleaner. Until then, here we are. This p-value is the final probability that enables us to choose which seems more likely, the null or the alternative hypothesis. I want you to pay attention to the words I'm using. Which hypothesis seems more likely? We are not claiming that either the null or the alternative is 100% the truth obtained by the world of statistics. Statistics provides evidence in favor of hypotheses. It does not 
tell you the way the world works. You need science together with a mathematical discipline like statistics in order to verify what we claim in the world of science to be truths. Hypothesis testing alone does not establish truths. Hypothesis testing helps you decide which of some claims seem more likely. That's key. I'm going to really focus on that as the semester progresses, because I feel like that's a common misconception about the world of statistics. OK, so let's try this again. In the world of hypothesis testing, we have data that we summarize into p hat for an example like this. With p hat and by the central limit theorem, we can calculate this quantity, which we call a test statistic. This test statistic helps us obtain a probability. The probability itself is the area under the sampling distribution in the same direction as the alternative hypothesis. So if you go back to our original statements about the alternative hypothesis, you'll notice that the alternative hypothesis we chose is less than. Because the alternative hypothesis is less than, we calculate p-values to the left of our test statistic. So all of this area here in the tail to the left of z, because the alternative hypothesis said less than, is known as a p-value. And we obtain p-values through our test statistic. And we got our test statistic by way of the central limit theorem using the data we had summarized into the summary statistic p-hat. The only piece of this puzzle that I've left out is relatively large and relatively small. Where did I come up with these phrases? What does relatively small mean? Let's highlight these because they are important concepts. Uh, so I'm going to keep my highlighter. I'm just going to move to blue because I want to do this quick. Oops, sorry. Relatively small. What do you mean relatively small? And over here, I say relatively large. What do you mean, Edward, relatively small and relatively large? To determine which hypothesis the null or alternative seems more likely we whoops I can spell we we compare the p value to the level of significance whoops I think earlier I called it the significance level doesn't really matter what phrase you use, significance level or level of significance. They're synonyms, but I just want to keep consistent here. We compare the p-value to the significance level. If p-value less than significance level, then reject null hypothesis. And that's the phrase statist statisticians use. If the p-value is less than the significance level, then reject the null hypothesis. 
you're rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. You're making the decision using this hypothesis testing framework in the world of statistics to identify the alternative hypothesis as the more likely claim to be true. We don't know if it's true, but it's more likely than the null when the p-value is less than the significance level. Alternatively, if the p-value is greater than the significance level, then, and everyone hates this, but this is the way you should go, fail to reject H um, the null hypothesis. When the p-value is large, relatively large, and by that I mean greater than this significance level, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. That is, there is not sufficient evidence against it to say the alternative seems more likely. Okay, I want you to take a minute to really comprehend fail to reject. It's a double negative. It's frustrating at first. I totally understand that. The idea is we don't want to say that the null hypothesis is true. We want to say there's not enough evidence against it to believe something else. We don't want to say the null hypothesis is true. We want to fail to reject it. That doesn't mean it's accepted, does not mean it's accepted. It means we don't have sufficient evidence against it to believe something else. So if we are going to continue our highlighting, then the significance level is the word we are defining on this page. Really, we're defining these two values, p-value and significance level, because these are the ones you need to make a decision about the hypothesis test you've established. The only last thing I'm going to do before we jump into R is let you know that the significance level is often denoted by the Greek letter alpha. So you could just replace alpha every time I say significance level throughout. And in fact, that's what's most commonly done in the world of statistics. We just understand the symbol, the Greek letter lowercase alpha, to mean this significance level. And moreover, at least in the life sciences, whether it be uh, like chemistry or biology or geology, 0.05 is the value chosen for the significance level. Now this is a subjective choice and a lot of people pick different numbers, but for now let's just stick with 0.05. Much like we just stuck with 95% confidence for at least a video or two, for now let's just stick to 0.05. That's all you need to know um, about choosing a level of significance. Later on, I'll talk about what to do with other significance levels than 0.05, but for now, we'll just keep 0.05 as the value we are going to compare to the p-value. Let's just go back to our very first slide and make sure we touched all the examples we need. So we went through a motivating example. That was our friend claiming that she shoots 90% of her free throws. We put these new words to our examples. Oh, and you know what we haven't done yet? Is given strict definitions to these new words. So we're going to define these new words. Null hypothesis came first, so we'll just give it a go. Null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the original claim to be evaluated. Oh, evaluated looks terrible.
The null hypothesis is the claim made by your friend or by some company, or sometimes you are even making the claim of a null hypothesis just because you want to establish some new piece of evidence in favor of, well, you want to establish some evidence about some population parameters that you are interested in. So in application, the null hypothesis often suggests um, some statement, uh, hmm, often suggests some value, no, it doesn't often, it always does. The null hypothesis suggests some value like 0 0.9 for a population parameter. And in fact, moving beyond this example, we could make some claim for values of population parameters, like all groups have same mean, which is to suggest that the null hypothesis is kind of either the default claim by your friend or some company, or it's the claim to suggest no effect, no difference, um, status quo. Okay, the alternative hypothesis is a little bit easier to set up. It's the competing claim. Against the null, but about the same parameters. That is, if the null hypothesis makes some claim about a population proportion, then the alternative hypothesis is going to make a claim about that same population proportion, but it's going to suggest that the null is not true. Like in our example, when we saw p equals to 0.9, claiming that our friend can make 90% of her free throws, the alternative hypothesis said that the true population proportion of made free throws by our friend is less than, not equals to, 0.9. The alternative hypothesis is just the opposite in some sense of the null hypothesis. Okay, we got a few more to go. We have a test statistic. This is the statistic thought of as a random variable. calculated from our data and used to obtain a p-value. So this is like an intermediate step in order to obtain this p-value. The p-value is the probability that we observe a summary statistic oops a 
a test statistic like the one we did or something more extreme assuming the null hypothesis to be true. And in fact, we assume the null hypothesis is true in the calculation of the test statistic itself. Let's just do a quick reminder about that. It's this part right here of the test statistic where we assume that the true population proportion is equal to what our friend originally claimed in the, hypo in the null hypothesis. That's the part that assumes the null hypothesis is true. Because the p-value depends on the test statistic itself, the definition of the p-value assumes the null hypothesis is true. That's where we are giving our friend the benefit of the doubt to say, if she actually shoots 90% and we observed 20%, then what is this probability that we get something like 20% if she actually shoots 90? Okay, our next one, oh, it looks like we need more pages here. That's fine. Null distribution is the distribution, mm, let's be more clear because we can, and that should help, is the sampling distribution of our test statistic assuming the null hypothesis is true. That is just like we uh, just explained, in the calculation of the test statistic, we subtract off whatever value shows up in the null hypothesis. By doing so, we are assuming the null hypothesis is true, and we're asking what's the sampling distribution of the test statistic, assuming the null hypothesis is true. We give that a name, it's called the null distribution. And then our last keyword is significance level, and this is just denoted by the Greek letter alpha, the value chosen to compare against the p-value. Often chosen to be alpha equals 0.05. Hopefully, these definitions mean more to you having gone through that particular example. So these are my general definitions, and when you need an example to attach them to, I ask you to go back first to our very, general, uh, very particular example about your friend shooting free throws and making claims about her true population proportion. After this and writing, after this video, and after you uh, put these definitions into your course notes, then go read uh, your Modern Dive textbook specifically section 9.3. So here we are, we've given our new words strict and very general definitions. They might have been too general had you seen them up front, but I think that's why our motivating example was helpful. Section 9.3 of Modern Dive will give you another example, another particular example, to see these general words. And then, once you have all that, you can jump into Biostat 
section 4.3, subsections 4.3.1 and 4.3.2 to see yet more examples about, in that case, population means. But much of the calculations are going to be exactly the same as we're about to do in R. So here we go. Let's fake some data. And if you are going to include, oh yeah, let's just do this. Let's say you should include some examples in your course notes about this make made believe scenario where your friend is shooting free throws. So what you should do to replicate these results in, uh, in your course notes from, from your console into your course notes is set the seed. I'm going to set the seed at, I don't know, I chose 663. And then I'm going to generate um, 50 observed values from the Bernoulli distribution with a probability of success of 0.15. So I'm going to evaluate our friend's claim that she makes 90% of free throws when, in this case, I'm going to generate data as if she really only shoots 0.15, 15% of her free throws. So we need to calculate p hat. That's just the mean of x. We need to calculate sigma hat. That's just the standard deviation of our observed values. We need our sample size, 50. And we need the standard error which is sigma hat divided by the square root of n. Now, according to the central limit theorem, we can calculate this test statistic z by going p hat minus whatever value shows up in the null hypothesis. According to our particular example, our friend claims she shoots 90% of free throws. So by the central limit theorem, we will start with our sample mean, subtract off whatever value we see in the null hypothesis, and divide by the standard error. From this value, we are going to calculate a p. From this test statistic, we're going to calculate a p-value. Now, a p-value is just a probability. And in this particular case, for proportions and proportions only, we will use the normal distribution instead of the t distribution. I will come back to that a little bit later, but for now, you need to keep the distinction in your head that for proportions, you'll use the normal distribution, and for means, even though they both are add up all the numbers, divide by however many there are, for means, you'll use the t distribution. So we're gonna go p norm for probability under the normal distribution, relative to z, and this is going to calculate area to the left, just like we had established in our, null, in our alternative hypothesis, and just like Q norm puts all the area to the left of the quantile of interest, P norm calculates all the area to the left. So later on, when we see hypothesis testing examples, where we have greater than or not equals to in the alternative, we're going to have to calculate this a little bit different. But I will have examples to show us that later on. So here's our p-value. And we are going to compare our p-value to our level of significance, 0.05. In this case, our p-value is less than 0.05. So we should decide that p hat is incredibly small, so small it casts doubt on the probability claimed by our friend. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis because the p-value is less than our level of significance. I would like you to come up with an example. You have to figure out what to change based on this to add to your course notes where you fail to reject the null hypothesis based on this same particular example about your friend claiming she shoots 90% of her free throws successfully. I want you to figure out what to change in this R code 
and please put it into your course notes such that you will pretty consistently fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is the world of hypothesis testing. There's a number of different variations on this, like the difference between proportions and means, or alternative hypotheses with less than, or greater than, or not equals to in the alternative. I fully plan to give you more examples of this uh, in lecture videos like this, but your book also contains more examples. So I highly encourage you to go read Modern Dive, section 9.3, and Biostat, 4.3, 4.3.1, and 4.3.2. And then next week we will see even more examples of this, because this is probably the most elaborate part of this entire course. But once you get a good understanding of this, which frustratingly depends on a good understanding of sampling distributions, I really don't think the rest of this class is going to be terrible. It's just going to be, you know, normal statistics hard. Aren't you excited for that?